Father, we pray especially for each person who is studying to be a minister, who will be blessed by this offering. Lord, we pray that you will take this money and multiply it and put it to good use where it is needed most. And Father, as we come this morning, we come to you and we ask that you will be with those in our community who are not able to be here today because they're ill. Lord, we pray that you will give them a special helping of your grace and of your presence this morning. Lord, we pray for those who are at home taking care of the ill people. We just pray that you will be with them too. Father, we pray for those who have been bereaved in the last while. And Lord, those for whom this is the first Easter without somebody. Lord, we pray that you will just walk closely with them and guard their hearts today. Lord, we pray for the leaders of this church. We pray for the leaders of the Methodist church. Lord, guide us in every step we take that we do what is your will to bring your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we pray that you will be with the leaders of our country. Lord, we know there are many of us. I just pray that this time they will draw close to you and listen for your voice as they make decisions and that their actions will reflect you more than anyone else. Father, we then come and pray for ourselves. Lord, we know that we have messed up, and Lord, not just in the last week, but every day, Father. And Father, we come before you and we say that we're sorry. Lord, we know that we've hurt your heart. We know that we've done things we shouldn't have done. We've said words we shouldn't have said. And Lord, we know too that there are many things that have, have been left undone that we should have done, which would have brought others closer to you. And so, Lord, we come before you today and we say that we're sorry. And Father, specifically because of today, because of the cross, we, we feel, we hear, we understand, and we accept your forgiveness for us. And we thank you, Lord, for that. And so bless this money, bless each of us here, and bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to this very special service. For those of you that were here last night, you will know just how special this is. We are on a journey this weekend, and uh, we're expecting a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, God's blessing and grace on us this weekend, and especially today, so thank you for that. I just want to welcome anybody that's a visitor here with us today as well, that's here with family. I know I've got my family here. Jim said, bring someone. I did. So they're here. And I, I must have that airplane ticket cost you from the UK, bro. Yeah, I've got from the UK and very far away Club View. <laughs> they are here. My grandson is here with us today as well. So th I, I'm just blessed for that and thank you. And I hope you all have a wonderful service today and are blessed by the message that we have today. I'm not going to ask how many birthdays we have because I know April, uh, coming into April is a terrible month for me. I have all the birthdays in April. So uh, uh, it's a terrible financial month, not a terrible happy month. So uh, yeah, so uh, to everybody or anybody that's got something really great to celebrate today, uh, you know, besides the fact that Easter is the most wonderful time for us as Christians to celebrate because of the moment and what happens, uh, and we'll hear about that even in the service. So uh, thank you all and be blessed and enjoy the rest of the service. Thanks, Joseph. Let's have a look at the notices. Thank you. You see, Jesus didn't just come for the covenant people. No, Jesus came. You see, Jesus didn't just come for the covenant people. No, Jesus came for you. He came for me. He came for the world. Welcome to our Sunday service at Midstream Methodist Church. Hello, MMC kids. Join us every Friday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. right here at the church. All grade ones to seven are welcome. Please remember to bring a friend along, come and have some fun. Join Alex every Friday night for MMC Youth starting at 6.30 p.m. in the Youth Hall. This is for all teens between the ages of 13 and 19. Please remember that on Sunday the 17th of March, the 9.15 service will be our confirmation service. We anticipate that the service will be fuller and longer than usual. 
We therefore encourage that you attend the 7.30 service next week. You see, Jesus didn't just come for the covenant people. No, Jesus came for you. He came for me. He came for the world. Welcome to our Good Friday service at Midstream Methodist Church. On Easter Sunday, we will have two services, the sunrise service at 5.45 in the morning and the Easter Sunday service at 8.30 the same morning. Please remember the following if you are attending the sunrise service. Bring camping chairs and blankets, dress warmly, bring along a torch, and you're also welcome to bring hot cross buns and rusks to share. We will also be selling breakfast buns after the sunrise service at 35 rand each. Cash or card payments are accepted. We would like to continue our annual tradition of asking for donations of used, in good condition winter coats and blankets. These will be given to those in need of an extra layer of warmth this winter. The collection crates will be in church for a few weeks for any donations of clothing. This Sunday's flowers are donated by Ray Gold in memory of his beloved wife's birthday and in celebration of their wedding anniversary. Our flowers are also donated by Michael, Duncan and Charlotte in loving memory of Michelle McLaren. Please remember that the church office will be closed on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. Just a reminder that we have a card machine in the foyer for easy transactions like tithes and payments for any of our church events. Please don't forget to follow, like and share our Facebook and Instagram pages at Midstream Methodist Church. Here's wishing everyone a blessed Good Friday and weekend ahead.
again, just to say thank you to to all the volunteers um, who kind of have made these services this week so special, and also to our staff who have been amazing. So last week we began a journey with Jesus as we headed into Jerusalem, as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And, and as we spoke a little bit about that, we suggested that Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey was in fact giving notice to all the things in our lives that taunt us, that harm us, that cause us pain and grief, that cause us to lose our focus in following Christ, uh, that damage us both physically, emotionally, and relationally. But before we get to the cross, which obviously is our focus today, I want us to go back a thousand years before the events that we've been reading about this morning. It's, it has to do with a young boy by the name of David who... Um, has, because he's the youngest, is the only one in the family of, of a whole lot of boys who's not allowed to go and fight in the army. His job is to look after sheep. Compared to them, how boring. But there's something about David. David has spent his life out in the fields talking with God and connecting with God. He knows who God is. He knows how powerful God is. By the way, just a reminder that David is the great, 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 great grandfather to Jesus. Jesus is of the direct lineage of David, who would later become the king of Israel. And so David goes down to the valley of Elah. Elah means God, so it's the value of God. He goes down to the valley of God where the Israelite army is encamped against the Philistines. And the problem is the Philistines have a secret weapon. It's the giant of a man, someone they call Goliath. Um, scriptures tell us he's nine feet tall, three meters. So he'll even make Simon seem like a small skinny guy. And, and one of the things that he would do is, is he would just, he would put on his armor every morning. This guy was obsessed by bronze. He would, you, know, you know some people have obsessions? I don't, I, don't tell me what yours is. But he was obsessed by bronze. So it was a bronze helmet. It was a bronze breastplate. A bronze shield. Bronze shoes. I mean, how big must you be to walk with bronze shoes like those guys that used to dive, you know, in the old days under the sea where they'd met? I mean, how big must you be to walk with bronze shoes? But every night he'd polish them until, the, until, until they were shining. He had a bronze sword, a bronze spear. And he would walk out onto the battlefield every single morning as the sun came up and the sun caught the bronze. By the way, bronze in biblical times was seen as something of judgment. So it, it was a, a metal that was used when, when judging or in judgment. Keep that in mind. And he would walk out into the field every single morning and he would shout at the Israelite army, hey, you bunch of grasshoppers. Because they seemed so small to him. You look, you look like little rats scurrying around. Why did you come and fight me? Every single morning. Occasionally, there was someone stupid enough, brave enough, to be willing to take him on. And it was just one swipe with the sword. And he was done. And so there were less and less people every morning who would be willing to take up the challenge. And so he would shout at the Israelite army and, and call them names and belittle them. This is the scene that meets young David as he goes to the valley of Elah to take some food to his brothers from his home. And after a while, he's particularly irritated by this, this fact that this Philistine 
is calling God's army names. And so one day he says to his brothers, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to, I'm going to go fight him. And of course, you know, if you're the little brother and you've got big brothers and you want to do something really stupid, they either laugh at you or they say, oh, it's okay, go jump on the roof. Let's see if you can bounce. You know how it goes. So they laugh at him. But words get, word gets to Saul, the king, and, and Saul calls David and he says, well, what do you want to do? He says, I'm going to fight Goliath. And, and Saul laughs at him, but you know, he eventually persuades Saul that he, that he wants to go. So Saul gives him his armor. And it's so heavy that this kid can hardly walk. So he just takes it off. He says, I, I can't work with this. And he goes out to the Valley of Allah. As he walks towards where Goliath is standing in the sun, this bronze judgment metal shining, he's walking and picks up one little stone, puts it in his bag and takes another stone. When he's got five, he starts unwrapping his slingshot. He carries it everywhere with him. It's a weapon that he's used against bears and lions and wolves. At this point... Goliath is standing there laughing. And he shouts at the Israelites, Are you sending a child to do a man's work? Are you sending out a child against me? You will never beat me. You're a, you're a small little puny thing. I'll wipe you out like a grasshopper. But David just keeps walking. And the, the giant Goliath is laughing at him. David reaches into his bag and takes one of the stones and puts it into the slingshot. And as he's walking towards Goliath, Goliath is just really laughing. He hasn't even bothered to put on his helmet that morning. He sees this little kid coming towards him. Mistake. He hasn't even bothered to put on his helmet. And David starts to swing the slingshot. And eventually it's whirring making a singing noise. And Goliath is still pointing a finger at David when he lets the stone go. And it gets David in the center of his head. It hits Goliath in the center of his head. And he goes down. You see, David had said, as Goliath was laughing at him and, and shining at him, he said, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. I come against you in the name of the Lord. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and cut your head off. This day I will give the carcasses of the Philist the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Those who gather there will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the Lord, battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. And as Goliath falls to the ground, a cloud of dust blows up. David rushes forward. And he begins to prize that big bronze sword out of dead Goliath's hands. And he begins to wield it like an axe and he cuts off his head. He picks up the head and he walks towards where Saul's tent is. Saul hasn't even bothered to come and watch. What good is this kid going to do? He walks into Saul's tent with the head of Goliath. It is done. And then David carries on, and he carries the head of Goliath to Jerusalem. And he buries it in an unmarked grave just outside of the city. That place thus became known as Gol Goliath, the heap of Goliath. A couple of hundred years later, people shortened the name. 
It is now known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. A thousand years later, we read this, John 19, verse 16. Finally, Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be nailed to a cross. The soldiers took charge of Jesus. He had to carry his own cross. He went out to a place called the skull. In the Aramaic language, it was called Golgotha. There they nailed Jesus to the cross. Two other men were crucified with him. One was on each side of him and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared. It was fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign. That's because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews argued with Pilate. They said, do not write the king of the Jews. Write that the man claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, I have written what I have written. See, it is there on the place of the skull where the skull of a giant was buried a thousand years before that the Roman crucifixion team planted a cross and they nailed Jesus to that cross there in the place of the skull Jesus dies you see Goliath shouts at David do you at the, at the army of Israel are you sending a child to do your work and here, on the place of the skull, God sends His Son, the Son of God, the child of God, to pay the price for your sin and mine, to make it possible for all the giants to be slayed. Because Jesus doesn't just slay one giant, He slays every giant in every single person's life. Let me ask you a question, and it's not a difficult question. What do Christians use to mark graves? A cross. Signified that someone has died there, or was buried there. And there on Golgotha, where a thousand years before, the giant was slayed by David and buried cross is put up as a reminder that this is where giants are slayed. This is where giants are killed. It's interesting that when David went and collected stones, he collected five. In the Hebrew language and culture, uh, numbers have significance or they mean other things as well. And the number five is the number for grace. <laughs> number five is the number for grace. David picks up five stones, the reminder of God's grace that will slay the giant. And as Jesus dies on the cross, what is his words, his last words that Jesus utters? Remember? It is finished. It is done. You see, that which Jesus came to do, which he gave notice of on Palm Sunday and did on Good Friday, he gave notice to the giants, I will come and deal with you just as David walked away with Goliath's head in his hand. It is done. Jesus cries out on the cross, it is done. Here, 
I slay the giant. The giants of sin and death. Those things that seek to harm us and hurt us. Those things that taunt us and terrorize us. And all of us have giants in our lives. Things that, that we just don't seem to be able to deal with. Or if we do, we, we kind of deal with them for a while, but then they take control again. These things that taunt us. These things that terrorize us. And these things that try to terminate us. The giants of addiction, the giants of obsessions, the giants of money and possessions, the giants of fear, the giants of death, the giants of illness, the giant of gambling, the giant of drug abuse, the giant of alcohol abuse, the giant of feeling worthless, the giant of hopelessness, the giant of depression. The giants of loss, the giants of isolation, the giant of loneliness, the giant of unforgiveness, the giant of bitterness. All of us have giants. I don't need to describe your giants to you. You know exactly what they are. Things that keep you awake at night or prevent you from having a peaceful sleep. The things that cause you to wake up at night in a sweat. Secrets, skeletons in the cupboard. Those things you just pray your spouse never finds out about. Or your parents. Those secret sins, you know what they are. You try to ignore them, but they just taunt you even more. You try to master them, but giants will not be mastered. They seek to master you. You try to placate them. You try to give them what they want, and they just keep wanting more. You threaten them, but then they retaliate and become worse. Giants bully and seek to destroy and harm. But on that cross, that cross planted on a hill called Golgotha where David buries his giant, a cross is raised where Jesus comes to bury your giant, to give you freedom and hope and life again. Every single giant is slayed and lies buried under the cross. And when Jesus is raised on the third day, no giant is raised again. They remain there under the authority of Christ, no longer able to do anything in your life except that which you give them authority for. So today is the day in which I want to invite you to take victory. The victory that Jesus has won for you on the cross when he slays your giants. Those things that seek to harm you. The giants of sin and death. I want to invite you to take that victory for yourself. In a moment, we're going to create some space for some prayer and some ministry. And up front, there are several bowls of stones with a red cross on. Because it is the cross of Jesus that defeats your giant, not a stone. And we're going to invite you, um, as we sing um, our closing song, to come and collect one of those stones and to hold on to it, take it home with you. Yeah. As a symbol of that which slays your giant. As a reminder that a cross was planted where a thousand years before a giant was slayed, a cross is planted in that same place where all the giants, sin and death in your life and mine are killed forever.
And then if you would like someone to pray with you, we're going to be here for as long as it takes. There's a whole team that is ready. So you can either take your stone and go back to your seat or even begin to head home if that's what you want to do. Or if you'd like to come and kneel and pray, uh, someone will pray with you. Uh, and, and we're going to simply ask the question, what giant do you want victory over? And we will pray with you about that thing and bless you. So we're not going to be here all day, but we'll be here for, for as long as we're needed. God's grace. The giants. Every giant will fall. Every sin defeated. The struggles that you have are put to death. And now Jesus begins to work in you. To change, to bless, to transform, to help you be the person that God wants you to be. So I'm going to invite the team to come forward uh, as I pray. Lord, thank you for David's reminder that it is in your name that giants are slayed. But thank you more than anything else that it is Jesus who comes, is crucified and dies on a cross on a hill called Golgotha. And that there Jesus slays every giant in all of our lives. So as we come to you this morning, may we remember that in you there is hope and freedom, that there is a way forward, that new life is possible, and that unlike you, raised on the third day, giants remain dead. We come. We come here to the cross where your love is poured out. We give ourselves to you. And we thank you that you have slayed our giants. Amen. Let's bless one another as we say the benediction together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.